Is it nonetheless possible to see his thought being shaped by his reading? I mean, I'm thinking particularly about racial theories. I mean, can you can you see books which actually fed into later policy decisions? There is no question, but actually the most astonishing discovery that I made, and um, I think it is is consequential, is a German translation of a book that was published in English in 1916 called The Passing of the Great Race by an American eugenicist named Madison Grant. We have the original book that that Hitler had owned. It's in the Library of Congress collection, and I think I would argue it is literally one of the most destructive books of the 20th century. Mm. Um, the basic argument that Grant makes is that demographics are the most powerful force in history. And what he predicts, what Madison Grant predicted for Europe, was that through various waves of immigration, it was eroding the central Nordic slash Aryan identity that had made Europe great. Mm -hmm. And that this corrosive process over the generations was, was going to lead to the destruction of Europe. Hitler read this imbibed it, took it to heart. You see it echoed again and again in his speeches and ultimately in his policies. I mean, if you read Madison Grant and you look at the social policies and ultimately the, the destructive military policies that Hitler implemented, Madison Grant is, is very clearly offers a, a roadmap for this. There was also his lifelong interest in spiritualism and the occult, and that too is reflected in his, his book buying and his reading, isn't it? That is an, another one of the, 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 I think, more useful aspects of, of, of the library. Um, what you had, um, you find books on spiritual and occult issues, some of them from the early 1920s, others books that he was collecting um, in, in the 1930s. And you, what you find is a lifelong preoccupation in these you know, spiritual and occult matters, many of these books with marginalia in them. Now, when it, it comes to fiction, it seems that his favorite writer was a, an adventure novelist called Karl May. What, what kind of books did he write? Well, Carl and I wrote these um, adventure stories that were basically aimed at teenage um, boys, um, Wild West, you know, in, in, the, in America, travels across deserts and oceans and things. And Hitler was became infatuated with these in his youth, but we have once again reports from people even during the war, Hitler kept returning to these books sort of for inspiration and, and, and solace. Tim, would you say that getting to know the contents of Hitler's library brings greater understanding of how his mind worked? Because he's, I mean, he's famously re regarded as, as impenetrable. So do you think the library really does unlock insights that are not available through studying his actions or uh, his writing or other people's observations of him? You know, I, I was struck by the fact that after reading Ian Kershaw's brilliant two, you know, 1,600 pages on the life of Adolf Hitler, he says in there that the man remains ultimately unknowable and, and almost impenetrable. And I do think that this library provides a, a unique insight into the man. And the, you know, the deeper you probe into it, the, the more aspects you find. And yes, I, I would argue it provides a singular window into Adolf Hitler in, in his most private hours. Um, some of them are enlightening, um, some of them are, are absolutely chilling. But you, you find yourself when you're sitting with these books, you know, as I say, experiencing this man in, in some of his most private moments. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about that in, in conclusion, Tim, because you're very um, sensitive to the, the texture of these books. You often describe how they, uh, the colors of the ink or the, the feel of the binding. And I wondered what it was like for you personally to be sitting, perhaps leafing through books which no one had touched or no one had, had, had opened the pages of since, since Hitler himself. The immediacy of 
a figure as horrible as he was, but also as consequential. It was really you know, sometimes a chilling experience, but, but also amazing. I, I think that the most remarkable moment for me was when I found this one book that he had bought as a 26-year-old corporal hmm. fighting in World, one, World War I on the Western Front. He inscribed his name and the date of the purchase of the book on the inside cover. And this is, I say, when Hitler was, was completely unknown, you know, hmm. front, you know, frontline soldier. And I opened up this book. The pages were splattered with um, red paraffin wax where he'd clearly been reading by candlelight. Um, I turned one page and literally trench dirt drizzled mm. from the pages. Um, turned another page and possibly most chillingly um, found a mustache hair. It's a moment in this man's life which was captured here a mile behind the front 26-year-old unknown corporal, and he closes this book, keeps it with him his entire life, and, you know, practically a century later, someone else opens this book, you know, in a, in, in a library in the middle of, mm. of Washington, D.C., and it uh, you know, captures the, the, the immediacy of the moment, but also that person, you know, literally and figuratively, mm -hmm. um, at this particular moment in his life. And that's what these books did again and again and again. And I guess what astonished me was how, with this remnant collection, we see Hitler at specific moments in his life and the ability of these individual volumes to, to, to capture him mm -hmm. and, and who he was.